Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Nola Ferguson. She is an associate professor at the University of Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. To talk about mycoplasma yes. today, and you know we haven't haven't covered that one today because people want to talk about infectious bronchitis and ILT and Newcastle. It doesn't seem like you hear about mycoplasma as much anymore, at least not with poultry. No, not so much. I think uh, there are a lot of different reasons for that, but you know, one of the things is I like to believe that you know people think that mycoplasma is too difficult a problem to deal with, so they put it on the back burner. But uh, it still is, you know, very important, and there's a uh, still very wide um, distribution. Um, every country has uh, some kind of mycoplasma, and if you are growing poultry, you've probably encountered problems with mycoplasma at some point, and you have some kind of mycoplasma control program. How prevalent is it in the United States, and, and, in, and in what segment of the industry? Yes, uh, in the United States, it is actually kind of special because. Uh, the U.S. industry has made a huge effort to control mycoplasma for many, many decades using the NPIP, the National Poultry Improvement Plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have made a tremendous effort to eradicate mycoplasma. And because of that, the incidence and prevalence of mycoplasma in the U.S. is actually very low compared to uh, other countries around the world. So for mycoplasma galaseptacum, which is the most pathogenic of the avian mycoplasmas, uh, the incidence is pretty low. You get maybe a few outbreaks uh, every year. Uh, it's a little higher for mycoplasma synovi, mostly because it's not as pathogenic as uh, galaseptica most of the time. So people don't necessarily uh, treat it as aggressively as they would mycoplasma galaseptica. So within the U.S., especially in the broiler type industry, the incidence is very low. In the layer industry, it tends to be a little higher, especially mycoplasma synovi. More than 70% of the um, commercial layers in the U.S. are likely to be infected with mycoplasma synovi, but it doesn't seem to cause them a lot of problems, so they don't make a big effort to control it. Uh, MG is also more prevalent in the commercial layer industry, mostly because a lot of it tends to be multi-age. And when you have multi-age situations, you tend to get a rotating, you know, revolving mycoplasma infection that is very difficult to clean out and eradicate. Uh, the backyard bird industry and the non-commercial industry, the prevalence of mycoplasma is very, very high. Uh, it can vary by state, uh, but it can be anywhere from 50% to 90% of birds that are infected. And what are the primary tools used for battling mycoplasma? In terms of control, uh, there are several different uh, ways to approach it. Uh, the U.S. and a lot of the uh, uh, Europe have an eradication approach where they focus mostly on having mycoplasma free stock. And in the U.S. that means NPIP certified mycoplasma free stock. And uh, then they try to use biosecurity to keep the mycoplasma out of their facilities as much as possible. They do a lot of surveillance and a lot of testing so that they detect uh, outbreak as early as possible and then ideally they will eliminate a positive flaw so it's not a source of infection for the rest of the complex and the rest of the company. Uh, in some situations where it is not economically feasible to uh, eliminate a flock, they would start trying other things like um, trying to use antibiotics to control the spread of the mycoplasma either to other houses or other complexes horizontally, but also to control the egg transmission of uh, mycoplasma to whatever progeny of the broiler breeders. Uh, mycoplasma vaccines are also a way to control mycoplasma. But uh, in the U.S., they tend to be used primarily in the commercial lay industry. And they are bacterins as well as live vaccines that are used to control mycoplasma in those situations. And so are they routinely used in the layer industry? Uh, it depends on the company. There's a lot of variability in terms of uh, where the laying facility is and uh, whether or not the industry and the state veterinarian will allow them to vaccinate. In the lay industry, it tends to be fairly routine. If they do have a mycoplasma outbreak, they tend to go to vaccination instead of trying to eliminate from a multi-age layer facility. So 
It is fairly common. Now, an interesting hap thing happened when we had the avian influenza scare <laughs> or outbreak uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, a lot of the commercial layers, not a lot, but several of them actually had to uh, eliminate all of their flocks because of the avian influenza. And because of that, they were able to start over mycoplasma free and had the opportunity to stop vaccinating and move to another type of control method at that point. How does, a, how does a disease normally present itself in a layer operation? Uh, what you'd usually see in layers is egg production drops. So um, you'd see egg production falls off and you'd see respiratory signs uh, in the layers. So um, you'll have some increase in mortality as well as air sacculitis and swollen head, sinusitis, that type of thing in the, the layers. But the most dramatic thing would be the egg production. And, and does it tend to be more subclinical or clinical? It depends on the strain. There's a wide variability in virulence of different uh, mycoplasma strains. So some MG or galaseptikum strains are very mild and cause very little disease, and some are very pathogenic and cause a lot of disease. Uh, the ones that we notice, of course, are the pathogenic ones, and then you see a very dramatic uh, decrease in egg production. So. Uh, same question for broilers. I know you said that it's less of a problem in broilers, but we still need to watch for it. Oh yes, we definitely need to watch out for it. And um, most of the focus for mycoplasma tends to be in the parents, so the breeders, not necessarily the broilers. And uh, there's also an age susceptibility with mycoplasma, so younger birds are more susceptible and have more severe disease. So in an adult bird, like the commercial, um, not the commercial, the broiler breeders, uh, you would tend to see some respiratory, maybe some increase in mortality, egg production drops, but the respiratory signs are not as severe as you would see in commercial broilers. In the commercial broilers, you can see very severe respiratory signs and mortality. Now, I know from covering stories about mycoplasma in cattle yes. and in pork, uh, it's often the tip of the iceberg because they say if you have mycoplasma, it sets the stage for other respiratory problems. Yeah. Does it work that way in poultry? It definitely works that way in poultry. Um, what I um, tend to tell people, whether they have a pathogenic or non-pathogenic strain of uh, either Galaseptikum or Synovia, is even if the mycoplasma itself is not causing you a direct problem, if you do have another disease on top of that, your birds are probably going to be more severely affected. Affected, So there's going to be a synergistic effect with the mycoplasma where instead of having, I don't know, 20% mortality, you may have 50% mortality if they are mycoplasma positive. So yes, definitely. Okay. And being a respiratory disease, I, I'm just guessing that there is a seasonal nature to mycoplasma. Not really. Not really. <laughs> you would think there would yeah. be, but no. Um, it tends to occur uh, most of all during the year, but we definitely see more of it in the U.S. during the winter because of the environmental factors. Uh, with the houses shut up and the ages set up for more uh, severe disease, but you tend to see it pretty steadily throughout the year. But what happens as uh, it starts getting cold and uh, the growers start shutting up the houses, you start seeing a lot of the complications that go along with the mycoplasma infection as well. On the broiler side of the industry in particular, where we're now uh, reducing and in some cases even eliminating the use of antibiotics, I've had some people tell me, well, this is going to set the stage for other diseases or some diseases that we thought we had taken care of could come back for an encore. Is that a possibility with mycoplasma, you think? Uh, it is a possibility. I think, um, as I said, the U.S. industry has done a pretty good job in due to keeping the levels low anyway, and they're still on an eradication type um, program. But uh, when you have broilers that are positive and are affected, you're not going to be able to treat them. So you will have higher mortality, more condemnations, and more economic losses because you don't have the tools to treat the mycoplasma infection once a break does occur. So yes, could be a problem. And lastly, diagnostics. If you want to stay ahead of the curve, ahead of the disease, yes. what do you recommend? There's a wide variety of diagnostics. And um, usually um, what I... Um, like to say if I had to choose two mycoplasma diagnostic tests that I would recommend that uh, everybody does you know consistently it would be ELISA's and PCR. Uh, ELISA's are 
not very expensive and they give you a very comprehensive view and you're able to look at patterns over time in terms of what is happening to your flock, whether they're being challenged or not challenged. And then PCR is very useful for evaluating your uh, vaccination. If you have a live vaccine, for example, trying to figure out uh, if the vaccine actually took or didn't take or uh, how protective and efficacious the vaccine is as well. So we have to be on the lookout for mycoplasma. We do. Absolutely. Thank well, you. thank you very much. Uh, we've been talking to Nola Ferguson. Uh, she's an associate professor at the University of Georgia. Thank you again. Thank you.